Humanity, Lecture 2. In our constructive theology text on page 97, M. Sean Copeland is quoted as saying, Part of the task of being human with others is relinquishing privilege. One of the questions that I have fielded in the past week in relationship to Humanity Lecture 1 was a request to explain the difference between humanity and the inclusion of humans. This question gave me pause, mostly because it helped me to see that I often get caught up in the theory of this theological life project of mine. And it's within this caught-upness that I often slide into a dangerous place of privilege constructed bias. That is, in my absolute quest to digest theory, theory that has been laid out for me by very excellent moral map makers, I myself have become too dependent upon the map that has been drawn before me. So this week's video lecture is going to be less luxury and perhaps, hopefully, more conversational. Before I begin, I would like to attempt to define for the group the difference between the terminologies of humanity and our created position of being human. Being human is what we are. That is, beings fashioned by some source bigger than what we, the created, could ever hope to define. For Christians, we define this source, or this creator, as God. But for those who are not Christian, definitions do not look the same as the Christian adaptation of God, which presents God as a paternalistic male who exercises dominion over the earth and what's included in the earth, or on the earth. Regardless of what our source looks like, the inclusive, or what we as a group of humans could be considered, could be labeled humankind. Our humanity is the perspective. Um, this is how we exist, function, and make decisions based upon our context and relationship with other humans. When reading the chapter in Constructive Theology text that approaches the subject of humanity, a statement by M. Sean Copeland captivated me. Within her exploration of slavery in context with the sacrament of Eucharist, Dr. Copeland writes, a broken and tortured body, the body of Jesus of Nazareth, is the most powerful mediating symbol of Eucharist. In their endurance of whippings, lacerations, abuse, rape, torture, and lynching, the bodies of black women and men form the site of others' stigmata. In their flesh, black women and black men made themselves available for a deeper grasp of the suffering of his body. As idolatrous practices, slavery, lynching, and their extension in white racist supremacy not only violate black bodies, but also blaspheme against God, against the body of Jesus of Nazareth, against the body of Christ. In Dr. Copeland's analysis, particularly as it relates to humans subjected to slavery, the narrative or the story being told tells us the humans in community as descendants of slavery or descendants of slavers that our humanity is unified within the suffering and tortured body of Christ. However, for some of us, we're not going to like the way that our humanity looks. Slavery was a church-sanctioned moral and ethical failure, though at the time, slavers would have argued that their moral map makers, that is the church and church leaders, drew the map that led slavers down the path of commodifying human beings. And slavers and moral mapmakers alike knowingly drew upon the Bible as the source map and the starting point for their painfully misguided, sin-filled evil journey. 
during the time that human beings were being subjected to the sort of torture and dehumanization that was brought upon them by slavery. Those who were the victims of brutality, human beings held in bondage to corrupt moral map makers, became vessels that represented the ultimate sacrifice presented through Jesus. During a time when sin and evil were presented as morality, evil was conquered not through evil retaliation, but rather through a manifestation of stigmata or reliving the suffering that ultimately revealed that moral map-making, when reliant upon human nature, can indeed manifest itself as sin. Constructed theology tells us that Augustine affirms that bodies are good and destined to preserve, be preserved eternally as marks of individual identity. And that's quote from page 92. And this sentiment sounds nice. Who doesn't want to be remembered as a good human? Who has lived up to their createdness in a grace-filled and God-honoring way? It would be safe to say that many of us truly believe that we use our gift of free will in a manner that is primarily ethical. But we can also see that evil and sin has determined the ethical reactions of some and in return the impact of poor free will decisions have determined how some human bodies will be identified within the narrative of history. However, understanding that these moral map makers drew maps that did not lead to ethical ends provides us with an inheritance that suggests that ethical decisions are situational and are dependent upon the greater good rather than what feels good at the time. Throughout the semester, in various capacities, I have become engaged with the projects that each of you have brought to the table. Within the context of these projects, the very humanity of each person in this group has been exposed. It is within these contexts that I have been able to get to know each of you a little bit better. Within our group, one of our colleagues is exploring how the structure of storytelling has the potential to impact the way in which we exist in community with one another particularly at the intersections of disability, mental health, and death. And this context is important, mostly because whether big, small, glamorous, or seemingly invisible, our very human lives are stories that interact and intersect with the stories of other human beings. Augustine believed that history is important, that remembering not only our ancestors, but also who we as individuals were in times past, is a critical component of our human formation. And there is truth in this. If the cliché stands true, if we are not different in our humanity from who we were ten years ago, five years ago, or even yesterday, and we are not realizing the fullness of our humanity and the fullness of self. And this is where the importance of storytelling becomes your human truth. Telling our stories gives us the opportunity to make ourselves vulnerable in ways that can be uncomfortable. But our stories can be liberating because the stories of our historical humanity tell the tales of how we sometimes become ensnared by morality drawn by moral map makers from our past, even if that map maker is ourself. Stories can remind us that bad decisions do not have to define us. Ethically good decisions have the ability to not only honor truth and good, but ethical decisions provide each human the ability to liberate self from some forms of morality formed to create a soul that works to imprison our very humanity. If you want to know more about this? Um, read Discipline and Punishment by, um, or Discipline and Punish by Michel Foucault. But that's another rabbit hole for another day. Theory cannot tell us how to tell our story. 
At best, theory can only inform the story, insofar as theory influences the ability to make ethical free will decisions. And even within the scenario of theoretical influence, it is easy to fall into a trap where the map drawn by the biases of the moral map maker threatens to distort the path of humanity in ways that are sinful and subsequently harmful to the whole of humanity. Theory can provide comfort during ethical confusion, but ultimately theory can work to normalize the story, thus categorizing our humanity into places that suggest that our responses can only fall into spaces of either or rather than all of the above. We are leaders of the church, and by church, I don't necessarily mean the various places that humans gather together in communion every now and again. Church is this place, every place, where we are confronted with the questions of how to live in community with one another. When we are faced with these questions, how we confront these questions begins a new chapter of our story. Each new ethical response creates a narrative by which the story of humanity will be preserved eternally. Using our gift of free will responsibly sets the framework for a meaningful story. So keep telling the story of your humanity. Our descendants are looking forward to being able to read it.